Welcome to Malpractice Podcast. Hi, are you ready to get started? I'm super ready. You're supposed to say, so are you ready to get started? Don't try and switch it up on so us now. So are you ready? <laughs> My bad. <laughs> you were like, hi. I was like, don't try new things. <laughs> I like new things. I like a new intro. Um, I'm Sydney. And I'm Jess. And this is Malpractice Podcast. And we like to argue about new things. We do. <laughs> We like to argue about most things, not always with each other. With strangers, absolutely. No, yes. we like to tag team. I'll argue with a stranger yeah. just That's at the our drop vibe. of a hat. Quick, quick. I have a question for you. Shoot. Do I look right now like a who from Whoville? Don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, what do I look like? And then I was I like, mean, oh my God. A who is, if you're... Okay, this is weird. You know how the who's have like a plump upper lip? Like, oh, yeah. If you had, I just did the Whoville face for everyone who can't see this as a podcast. <laughs> um, if you had like a plump upper lip, like if you stuck a cotton ball up there, Whoville all day. <laughs> Dang. I was like, I look interesting today. I don't know how to describe it to myself. And then I was like, I do know how. <laughs> I mean, you do have like the trademark, like little ski slopey nose you know yeah did you know your nose gets bigger when you're pregnant I did not know that and I hate it <laughs> I that's I heard it I was like you're I don't know if that's true or not actually I did hear it and I was like that's rude <laughs> I know for sure that your feet get bigger because my mom was telling me that when she was pregnant she basically had to like buy completely new shoes if my feet get bigger yeah I'm going to be so mad. No, same. Like, she went up a full shoe size. We already have, like, we, we wear, like, an eight, eight and a half. Yes, we That's both do. That's a lot. Yeah. It's a pretty big foot for a, you know, already. I don't want to have a bigger foot. I already feel stupid being 5'2 with a big foot. Yeah, at least I'm tall and I have big feet. I get what you're saying. I feel dumb. No, it's fine. You don't look dumb. But I will say when I wear, like, tennis shoes. Like, have you seen those girls that wear the Dino Stomper, like, white tennis shoes? I want some, but I, I can't would never wear do them. that. No, same. Because I would look like, my foot would look like a colossus. I'm upset. I can't do it. I, I could do with my nose. Fine. I'll get a nose job. Mm -mm, not but me. I can't get a foot job. <laughs> I already had a nose job. Can't afford another one. <laughs> oh, I'm upset. I don't want it, period. Should we period. all sing happy birthday to you? Oh, my God. Absolutely not. Happy Jessica, birthday Jessica, the number of times she has sang happy birthday <laughs> to me. Last week, I turned 30. Happy birthday. Because of Jessica <laughs> and my immediate family, I have had three separate cakes, <laughs> which feels appropriate because yeah. one for each decade. Yeah. I love cake. Tell me I'm wrong. I love all cake, all dessert, all the time. What else? Uh... We had Thanksgiving this week. What's your favorite Thanksgiving side? Like, what's the highlight of the show for you? I can't tell you. It's so dumb. What is it? Tell me. My favorite Thanksgiving side. I won't tell anyone except all of the people who listen to this. Is bread. <laughs> Dude, I'm not knocking bread. Bread is the highlight of my life. I don't care. I don't care if it's Hawaiian rolls. Oh. I don't care if someone handmade it. I don't care if it's those frozen Thanksgiving rolls. I don't care. I'm always like, oh, I'm about to eat that. I love bread. <laughs> I You won't catch no flack for me. I think my family does this thing every year before Thanksgiving. I go to Trader Joe's and I get their brioche Ooh. bread. Yeah. And we do Thanksgiving leftover sliders on brioche bread. And it is. That sounds great. Ah, that's the highlight for me. But also I love me some yams. Oh, do you? Like sweet potatoes, my grandma bakes them with like a layer of marshmallows on top. Oh, yeah. That's the only way. It's like brown sugar and marshmallows. It's basically dessert, but it is yeah. ah, chef's kiss. The, oh, my God. It's my favorite. I love that. I like, but then people sometimes put nuts. Who would dare? And I hate that. You're ruining it. And I like nuts. Do you know, uh, remember, I don't, 
in the office when um, Dwight is making brownies and then he pours in all the walnuts and Kevin's at the window like, no! <laughs> That's me when people put nuts on stuff. I'm like, why did you do that? It's a strong choice to put nuts in something that you haven't like clarified with everyone that they're yeah. okay with nuts. Like if yeah. I'm making cookies for a party, I'll like text people and be like, yo, do you like nuts in your cookies or nah? For me, no. And like 75% of the time, people are like, absolutely not. Don't do no. it. I don't want it. I also love, um, this is so weird. I love cranberry sauce, but like my mom will home make cranberry sauce and I only want the one from a can. Yeah. I was about to say, that's a very, that's a choice. People either yeah. like from a can or homemade and there's no in between. <laughs> and there's no in between. Nobody's like, oh, I'll have a little bit of each. No, absolutely not. Because I like homemade. Oh, you do? I don't like the can. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess it's not crazy. Everybody has their thing. But like at Thanksgiving, me and my grandpa would be the only people eating the one from a can. <laughs> and everybody else is like, that's disgusting. Because you shake it out and it's like, Hoop! like it makes the sound yeah, when it gross. comes out of the can. It's not. It's like cat food vibes. Yes. Strong cat food vibes. It's not appetizing. I'll give it to you. But it is so good with like stuffing or mashed potatoes. Mwah. What do you think Eric's favorite Thanksgiving dish is? Ham. He likes ham. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a meat and potatoes guy. Yeah, yeah. He likes like ham and probably stuffing. What about Michelle? What's her fave? She loves the sides. So like yeah. casseroles. Mm-hmm. Um, I know we specifically didn't have this this year, but like she has spoken about that broccoli rice. Hell yeah. I love broccoli that rice. that people do. Yeah, so she's she like loves that kind of stuff. No, same. Basically, anything that like a Midwesterner would take to a funeral, that's what I love. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, I had a casserole this year. This woman brought it. Yeah. It was a basically a cornbread casserole, which I love cornbread. Hell yeah. And it had jalapenos in it, but it was also sweet corn, mm. so it was like really, really good. That I was sounds like, really who made good. this? Who made this corn? Right. And I want it, <laughs> but like. It loves me a casserole. That's who we are. I also love mac and cheese. Like, I made homemade mac and cheese. I love mac and cheese. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. You made that for your family? Well. Did they like it? Um, You know, a hot take or whatever. People have very distinct opinions on whether or not mm-hmm. mac and cheese belongs at Thanksgiving. They do, yeah. Everybody has a strong opinion about that. So, I didn't yeah. know that. Because I believe mac and cheese belongs wherever mac and cheese. Absolutely, positively. I'm not gonna. I am not gonna shun mac and cheese. Who am I? Who am I who, to dare? Who are we? No, mac and cheese is a staple of Thanksgiving. I don't care who you are. Okay, I I think so too. I think if you don't have mac and cheese, it would be weird. Okay, agreed. I feel like people always sleep on Thanksgiving desserts, but I love pumpkin pie. Oh, yeah, I do, too. Oh, it's a bop. My grandma, I'm the only one who ever eats pumpkin pie, so my grandma literally every year will make a pumpkin pie and pull it out and be like, I made this for you. It's so sweet. I love pumpkin pie. I love every pie except pecan. I'm not a huge pecan gal. If I'm not, if I'm being honest, I'm not a huge pecan gal. I don't like pecans. They have a very strong, aggressive taste. They do, yeah. I don't like it. (laughs) I'm not a huge... Okay, I've had a chocolate pecan pie. Okay, that's different, though. And it's different, and I do fucks with it. I won't Because lie. I like chocolate. Same. And, and thus, I will eat everything with nuts in it, a.k.a. pecan chocolate chip cookie. Will I eat that? Yes. Yeah, same. Would I eat a pecan cookie? No. Right. Right. Well. And that's a lot for me, because I will eat almost I'm every I'm not going to lie. My dad eats those. They're called a pecan sandy. I don't like them. Okay, my dad loves those, and I will say I've been known to dabble with a pecan sandy. I don't like them, and that's crazy to me because I will eat if it has sugar in it because yes. I was wronged as a child. You were wrong. I will <laughs> eat it. I don't care what it is. Jessica's mom, like when we were kids, maybe we've talked about this before, made like homemade fruit leather. Oh yeah, with no sugar added. It's like fruit roll-ups, Who? but depressing. <laughs> <laughs> That's an exact description. It's a depressing fruit roll up. That's a hundred percent. This is malpractice, and we're a food based podcast. Honestly, we would do so well talking about food. Yeah. So that's Thanksgiving, <laughs> in our opinion. Post your favorite Thanksgiving 
uh, side. Yeah, we should do a poll or something. Yeah, I'll do a poll. Speaking of polls, do you want to get into it? <laughs> Speaking of polls, is this... No, there's a. this is actually a transition that I have. Is there a poll-based opening here? Yes, yes. Okay. So we did a poll a while ago on our oh. Instagram. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about now. I thought this now. was going to be about like polls, like oh no, like a how how polls have caused in in injury, like a That's cast your I vote poll. <laughs> I'm so. Dumb. Can you imagine if it was just like these are all the ways you can die from a poll? <laughs> that might be where we get to when we're on episode like 2000. Honestly, <laughs> like here's the, all the ways people died from blankets. I was here's thinking about doing that because apparently <laughs> you're more likely to die from a falling refrigerator than you are from a shark attack. Did you know that? And a toaster. More people die from toasters than from shark attacks. I learned that on Sister Wives. Yeah, it's crazy. Like you, whatever. Anyway, the reason we're doing today's episode, which if you clicked on it, you already know it's what it's about, is because... A few months ago, we I, I was torn between two episodes, and I posted on our Instagram, which do people want to hear? And it was like 60% one thing, which I don't even remember what episode it was pulled for. And then it was 40% nitrous oxide, which is the episode we're doing today. I voted for this Me too, yeah. yeah. I voted for this. <laughs> I was like, I love the idea of an episode based on nitrous oxide, so that's what we're going to talk about. Awesome. Nitrous oxide, a.k.a. laughing gas, a.k.a. N2O or dihydrogen monoxide, a.k.a. whippets, a.k.a. hippie crack, a.k.a. NOS. It has a lot of names. All the best things do. Yeah, exactly. Whatever you want to call it, nitrous oxide has a very interesting history, both as a party drug and as a medical tool. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm not surprised, but I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. It's so it's actually the 14th most used drug in the entire world as of now. Damn. Isn't that crazy? That is that is weird. Yeah. I have to say up front, the idea for this topic was brought to you basically directly by the podcast Stuff You Should Know. Shout out to them. It's a good podcast. If you haven't already listened yeah. to their show, you are missing out because they have some really super interesting episodes. So before we get into how it became like super commonly used as a party drug, we're going to throw it all the way back to the beginning. Nitrous oxide is made up of two nitrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, hence the chemical notation N2O or dinitrogen monoxide. And it was discovered in 1772 by an English chemist named Joseph Priestley. Why did I think you were going to say 1772, like they <laughs> do in Hamilton? <laughs> New, New York, York City. City. No, this was in England. <laughs> Joseph Priestley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. England was in the middle of, like, basically losing its colony, and this guy's like, what if we invented a gas? <laughs> what if I make a drug for us? <laughs> Literally. So... The discovery was outlined in a manuscript that he called Experiments and Observation on Different Kinds of Air. <laughs> I know, it sounds really stupid. Yeah. <laughs> but at this time, if you were like a chemist who studied gas, they called it the study of like the airs. Oh. When he discovered nitrous oxide, he called it deflagisticated nitrous air, which is stupid. Oh, God, we got to where we are now. <laughs> and the reason that he called it that is because during this time, he invented something that's like still used in chemistry today called a pneumatic trough, hmm. which is basically a fancy chemistry water bong. <laughs> like, oh. that's what it is. It's a bong. <laughs> and it en enabled him to produce purified nitrous oxide. So he produced this colorless, mostly odorless gas by heating ammonium nitrate in the presence of iron fillings. And then this little column like passes it over water and the water. Water like suctions out toxic byproducts, so you're left with nitrous oxide gas. Hmm. So he discovered it, and he was basically like, "All right, dope. That's it. <laughs> That's all we got." He literally was like, "Yo, here's this gas. It exists. This is how you make it." And he was a chemist, so he didn't give one single shit about what it did biologically. He was like, "Here it is. Do with it what you will." Oh, he was like, "I will go down in the history books." I don't care how you go down. <laughs> Literally, that's pretty much that's pretty much what it was. He's like, I invented this. I isolated it by myself. It's just me. I'm fancy. And then we're done. It was probably his wife that did it. Literally. <laughs> you know it was some woman who didn't get credit for it. So the next dude to pick it up and check out what it actually did to people was this guy named Humphrey Davy. Oof. 
I know. <laughs> I'm going to call him Humphrey for the rest of the episode. <laughs> Mr. Humphs. That's what I want to call him. Yeah. So he got a hold of nitrous oxide for the first time in 1799, and he started ex- experimenting with it on himself by basically just inhaling it. Like, just willy-nilly. He, like, willy-nilly. heard about this gas, and he was like, what if I just breathe it straight into my lungs? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what he did. And I just want to take one moment here to, like, pour one out for what science used to be. Because as a modern scientist, I can tell you one thing I would never do is go ahead and start experimenting on myself. (laughs) I would never. But Humps was like, look, I have a shitty name. This other guy already found the gas. Let me see if I survive breathing it in. Correct. That's literally what he did. And he was all about it. Of course he was. It fucking made him so happy. (laughs) He was like. (gasps) Yes. Also. Every time I read about Humphrey, he was an absolute bro, number one. And I mean, that like, he was like a party bro. Yeah, obvs. Obviously. If he's down to, like, inhale a random gas, sure. And also, these, like, 1800 science bros were, like, basically all ready to die for their work. They just were. How, How did one become a chemist, like, in this time period? Did you actually go to school? They went to school, most of them did, but there wasn't, like, an accreditation process like there is now. It's like, Mm. you basically went to school, and then you were like, I'm a chemist, and you got a job doing chemistry. And they were like, all right, he's a chemist. How long? Do you know how long they would go to school? I don't know. That's a good question. I'll have to look that one up, but I think it was like... Because there's times in history where you just, like, go to school until you feel like you know everything. I'm pretty sure that was, like, their vibe. Yeah. Seems like this guy only went to school for, like, one... (laughs) <laughs> yeah he got inducted into a fraternity and then dropped out and was like bam i'm a chemist <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much what happened so a co- wh- okay basically this guy liked to party most of the scientists at this time probably died of some super weird and horrible cancer 100 percent. but they all like to party and that's what they have in common What's interesting is that according to the Stuff You Should Know podcast, apparently mycologists or scientists who study mushrooms still do this. Like if you discover a mushroom, the common practice to this day is to eat it yourself first. Like I have two thoughts. A. Yeah. What gave you the right? (laughs) And two, which is also B. Why are we still discovering mushrooms? <laughs> Dude, that's a great question. I If you think about, like, how much time you'd have to spend in the wilderness to discover a mushroom, couldn't be me. Honestly, you lost me at the word wilderness. <laughs> Could not. You lost me. Glamping only for this bitch. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Literally. It, it's crazy to me how we're still discovering stuff, like, the in the ocean. Yeah. But then I'm like, okay, well, it's big. It's super big. So that kind of makes sense, like. Things can evade you. Totally. But a mushroom? No, mushrooms like, are how like... how are you still discovering mushrooms? I'm guessing it's probably a mushroom that looks like another mushroom, and they're like, ah, that's the same mushroom. And then they look closer, and they're like, and oh, like, shit, now I have to eat this. But how do they know if it's not? We need a mushroom scientist. On we podcast. do. I have several questions. Mushroom scientists, hit us up. Okay. Hit us up. So... Back to Humphrey. At this time, around 1800, our man's Humphrey (laughs) is hanging out with a bunch of other scientists and thinkers like, for instance, the inventor James Watt. Thinkers, we use that loosely. Yeah, (laughs) totally. They're like poets and whatever. Basically, he's around other people who like to do drugs. Gotcha. So one of them is this guy, James Watt, who revolutionized the steam engine. He's credited with actually propelling the Industrial Revolution of Great Britain. So he's cool. There's a couple poets... Basically, dudes who like to party hanging out together. Wow, with a chemist. That's Sounds what's like happening. my like worst nightmare, to be honest. <laughs> honestly, I would hate that. <laughs> honestly, I'd probably go to this party. I ain't gonna lie. You know how I am. You would definitely go, and I would definitely pick you up. Totally. <laughs> so basically, Humphrey's sitting around with these dudes. He gets wind of this new gas, and they're just inhaling it at parties. All of them, and. They started doing this because it creates a feeling of euphoria. Yeah. Which led him to nickname nitrous oxide laughing gas, which was coined in this manuscript that he published in 1800 called Researches Chemical and Philosophical Concerning Nitrous Oxide and Its Respiration, where he basically just said, this is what the gas does. So he didn't discover it. No. 
Was he the first person to inhale it? I don't know if he was the first to inhale it, but he was definitely the first to write about what happened when you inhaled it. Oh. Yeah. He took credit for something someone else did. I mean, maybe, but he and all of his bros... I bought to you, Humps. ...were, like, the ones who basically brought it into, like, public knowledge. I just feel like, at this time, he probably didn't discover much. (laughs) It doesn't sound like he discovered much. I feel like, yes, you're right, and I also feel like you have to be willing to, like... Give some props to the guy who's like, yeah, I'll just have a shitload of this and see what happens. I don't know about props, but I will give him (laughs) credit for that. I will give him, like, he has very, um, like, stone balls. Yeah. Because I would never do that. I will acknowledge that he did risk a lot of brain cells. Correct, yes. For the knowledge here. Probably lost a lot of brain cells, too. Of shit ton. So, basically, during this time, he figured out the effects of nitrous oxide on the human body by basically, like, sitting around huffing it with his friends. That is so crazy. Correct. That they were just like, breathe it in. Literally. <laughs> Bring it it's out. It's also important to note that he was, like, 20, early 20s <gasps> when this is happening. Oh, yeah. He wasn't in school for very long. No. <laughs> and I also feel like when you think about the context of him being in his early 20s, him, like, huffing it makes a little bit more sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's all coming together Coming now. together. Right. So he's like a party boy in his early 20s. He's just like, yes, I'll breathe in anything. In his first big experiment, he said that he breathed 16 quarts of it. Holy shit. That's a ton of nitrous oxide. That is a lot. For like seven minutes solid. And he said, quote, it absolutely intoxicated me. Yeah, no kidding. (laughs) Right. So he had a doctor administer it, and he basically told him to keep administering it at that same dosage for, quote, as long as I am conscious. Holy are you serious? Okay, yes. yeah, I'll give him credit for risking all life. I mean, it seems stupid to me. It sounds so stupid. Guess how long he did it for? I don't even want to know. It was an how? hour and 15 minutes. Oh, my God. He kept doing that dosage for an hour and 15 minutes. So then he stepped out of the box. The doctor was like, you need to stop doing this. All of his friends were like, how is this dude still standing? And he was like, He literally came out of the box and was like, oh, shit, I love this stuff. Yeah. He's a party boy. Yeah. That's, like, way too much. So when he was huffing it. Yes. What does it actually do to you? Because it's not, like, is it, like, blocking senses? Okay, that's a great question. Or are you just feeling so pleased that you don't care that people are, like, taking your teeth out of your mouth? Because that's what I know it's used for. It's a little bit of both, actually. Okay. So some of the known effects are the like feeling of euphoria that he described in his medical notebook, analgesia or pain reduction, heightened imagination, and allegedly he said it cured hangovers from alcohol. Who knows if that's true? He would know. He, w- <laughs> he would definitely know. He would 100% know. Party boy lifestyle. <laughs> so in his lab notebook, he describes like his vision is kind of like bright and dazzly. He feels loopy. He generally felt like disconnected from his own body, which is part of what makes it a great anesthetic and part of what makes people want to do it recreationally. Yeah. So while he was absolutely having a blast inhaling the laughing gas, which sounds less like lab work and more like a just a rager to me, he was also doing things like inhaling carbon monoxide. Which, as we all know, probably, is a colorless, odorless gas that is toxic in relatively low doses. (laughs) So while he was doing this, my dude almost died before his lab assistants, like, brought him out into fresh air. And as they carried him out, he's reported to have, like, croaked out, I do not think I shall die. Then that was it. And then he was in pain for several hours. Well, I do not think you are the expert here. Yeah, correct. (laughs) So that's Humphrey Davy. It, like, Humphrey Davy basically just huffed nitrous oxide until he could call it science. And that's what he did. So it makes you loopy and happy. Mm-hmm. And how And how does it do that? Yeah, that's a really good transition and great question. What we know now in modern times, and these are all, like, very recent findings, is that when you inhale nitrous oxide, it gets into your bloodstream, crosses the blood-brain barrier, and gets into your brain through those local arteries that carry, like, oxygen and nutrients into your brain, and then it does a couple of different things, which you were talking about earlier. The full mechanism is not really well understood, but the current idea is that it produces that analgesic or anti-pain effect 
and the anxiolytic or anti-anxiety effects that it's used for in like dentistry by enhancing the activity of receptors in your brain called GABA-A receptors and by interacting with endogenous opioid receptors in the noradrenergic system of the brain and by binding alpha-2 adrenoceptors in the spinal cord. So it produces the anxiolytic or anti-anxiety effect in the same way that benzodiazepines do. Okay. So basically... They compare like a 30% concentration of nitrous oxide with the same effect as about 10 to 15 milligrams of morphine because of the effect that it produces. Oh, God. But it's way, 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 way better for you than morphine. Oh, okay. I was about to say, oh, God. Yeah, we'll get into it, but it's like basically non-addictive. It clears your system as soon as you stop breathing it. Like, it's much better. Oh, okay. We allow. Yeah, right. We also know that in rats, it stimulates what they call the mesolimbic or reward pathway by promoting the release of dopamine and activating these dopaminergic neurons, probably blocking the receptors for a neurotransmitter called NMDA. So there's like a burst of dopamine. Your ability to sense pain is blocked. And dopamine, for those of you who don't know, is like the happy neurotransmitter, basically. And that probably accounts for the feelings of like euphoria that people have. Okay. So basically, all of that is a super technical like neuroscience way of saying it produces analgesic or anti-pain effects. It reduces your anxiety and it makes you feel like generally pleasant and happy. Sounds okay. Right. I don't know about 16 quarts, but it sounds okay. (laughs) I mean, that's a lot for sure. (laughs) And in high doses, there are some pretty damaging effects. Of course, yeah. um, Which we'll talk about later, but you have to do like a shitload of it to experience any of those. Like humps. Like humps. Like our man humps. (laughs) So our man humps discovered these effects in 1799. And he predicted, actually, in his paper that I talked about, that it would be useful in surgeries. However, for the next 44 years, it was basically just used by rich British people at parties to get high because, of course, it was. Tracks, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's history. People are like, can I get high off of this? Perfect. And then they're like, oh, I guess we could use it for medicine. Okay, whatever. Right? <laughs> that's pretty much what happened. Yeah. It's not as cool if it's medicine, though. Right. I mean, people are like, can it get me stoned? Yes. Um, It wasn't until the 1840s when there was this American dentist named Horace Wells. Another, don't name your kids Horace. I'm sorry. Don't do it. It's not a good name. It's really not. It's like really not. <laughs> I I kind of hate it. Every time I read it, I'm like, Horace. I don't. Horace. I ideal. read it like that. Horace. Like Horace. That. Horace. <laughs> It's not good. Kids are cruel. Don't name your kids Horace. We're cruel. <laughs> I don't like it. I don't like it. Correct. So, fast forward to the 1840s. Our man's Horace is an American dentist who found out about this gas actually at a traveling carnival. Ah, uh, where all good things go to die. <laughs> Quite literally. And he basically thought to himself, like, I'm a dentist. People absolutely hate coming to the dentist, and that bugs me. It bums me out. So what if I could give people this drug that made them, like, kind of chill out and be less stressed while they're having dental work done? Okay. Also important to note, lidocaine, which is the local anesthetic that dentists use now, wasn't invented until 1943. Oh, Yeah. So at the time when people were having dental work done, they basically gave them, I'm not exaggerating, like a shot of whiskey and were like, deal with it. Oh, hell no. (laughs) Which is objectively a bummer. That is such a bummer. So Horace was like kind of a revolutionary for his time. He was like, let me try this nitrous oxide stuff out. Right. And and he's an actual medical professional. He's a dentist. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. At the time, he actually needed himself to have a tooth pulled, so he had some of his dentist buddies, again, practicing on himself. Like those mushroomers. I mean, which is objectively better than practicing on other people. Uh, No, I agree, actually. I do agree. Yeah. So he had some of his dentist buddies, like, administer nitrous oxide to him right before he had his tooth pulled, and he noted that, like, it went extremely well. He's like, if there was pain, I don't remember it. I felt really chill. I really didn't feel a thing. And that was the very first time that nitrous oxide had ever been used as a clinical anesthetic. Hmm. And he basically was like, this shit's amazing. Let's use it all the time. He used it on 12 more patients. It went well. 
So he set up a demonstration for a group of Harvard doctors and medical students at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston on January 20th. 1845 to show them his discovery he was like yo the shit's a bop y'all gonna love it yeah line up and they did unfortunately for horace he set up the display where he planned to do like a routine tooth extraction for this crowd so he gives the patient nitrous oxide unfortunately he didn't give the patient enough of the drug Mm. so as he's pulling the tooth the patient goes absolutely nuts The crowd basically boos him, and they're like, you're trying to swindle us. We don't trust you anymore. And Horace falls into a super deep depression and eventually becomes addicted to ether and chloroform, which are other anesthetics used at the time. He abandoned his family, and he died while on a bender. What the heck, Horace? Yeah. Like, he went downhill fast. Just do another experiment, my dog. No, he was like, I'm a public fraud. I'm a sham. Like, no one. But he was right. Oh, He was completely right. And as most people now know, we've been using laughing gas in dentistry basically ever since. In fact, the American Dental Association honored Horace Wells posthumously in 1864 as the discoverer of modern dental anesthesia. The American Medical Association recognized his achievement in 1870. And there's a university in France that posthumously awarded him an MD, an honorary MD. Oh, that's nice. For his discovery. But poor Horace. It's easy to do that stuff when he died. Right. I mean, he died without knowing about the legacy that he actually left behind, but we've been using it literally since then. Yeah. So following his discovery, there's a long period where people were clinically using nitrous oxide to sedate and anesthetize patients without rendering them unconscious, which is a huge medical breakthrough. Yeah. In modern times, it is still the number one inhaled anesthetic in the medical profession, and especially in dentistry. People use it all the time, right? Yeah. So part of the reason that it took so long to catch on is that when you inhale N2O or nitrous oxide, it can actually replace the oxygen in your brain. So the cells in your brain don't get enough oxygen and they don't actually metabolize like 99.9% of it. So after you breathe out, when you exhale nitrous oxide, you're basically fully exhaling the drug because your brain doesn't process almost any of it. Oh, okay. And because it displaces oxygen, that means if you inhale like pure nitrous oxide, your brain doesn't get enough oxygen. Because I see. So you just put in oxygen, you're fine. Yeah. A hundred percent. Love that. It's commercially available today in different blends. Blend. Oh, yeah. They put, okay. Of like Science. of like oxygen and nitrous oxide. So like the ones you get at the dentist office would be like seventy percent oxygen, thirty percent nitrous oxide. Um, but it's commercially available up to like fifty fifty. Wow. Okay. And it's safe at that level. Um, I'll get into it later, but they recommend it for everything up to like childbirth at 50, 50 doses because it's not actually harmful at that dose. Oh, hell yeah. So you can get, yeah. <laughs> wait, you can get an epidural and you can have happy gas? You can do both. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. I don't know why everybody doesn't do that. Why don't people do that? I would do, I'm doing it. So let's just talk about it right now. Um, let's talk about it. That's a bop. For ch- like for childbirth. It's still commonly used in obstetrics as an aid for people going through childbirth. Um, 60% of people who give birth in the UK in like modern times have nitrous oxide. But in 2016, only 1% of U.S. hospitals offered it for people in labor. Why? I don't know. And it's actually seems like... It actually seems like it's changing now since 2016. It's become much more available and more and more hospitals are starting to offer it as a potential alternative to epidurals because number one, epidurals can be kind of dangerous and they're 100%. very, 100%. very expensive. Whereas nitrous is actually really cheap and it seems to have almost no side effects when it's used this way. So what they're doing now is uh, what a method called self-administration, where the person in labor actually controls how often they inhale like a 50-50 blend of nitrous and oxygen. So you basically hold the mask in your hand. Oh, fuck yeah. Right. I'm about to, I'm about to be just holding it to my face. <laughs> and it's safe at that concentration. 
um, they found that it doesn't pass to the fetus. So a bunch of different like pregnancy and maternal groups are pushing to allow for that like self-administration of the 50-50 blend. And I bet people just don't know about it to ask, right? I think that's what it is. Yeah. And those who have had it during labor and the, the labor and delivery nurses who, who use it in the UK say that the mothers who use it during childbirth sometimes feel pain, but because of that like body disassociation, they just don't really care that the pain is happening. Uh, that's not going to be me, but I'm happy for them. It like disassociates you from the experience, kind of. <laughs> I, I mean, that's what people say, but also it's basically, they describe it as like you've temporarily like stepped out of your body yeah. and you're like, I don't care what's happening there. That's not me. I'm, I'm down to clown. And I don't play around. So that's Give me that. that's kind of what's going on now with doing it in childbirth. But again, like people have been doing this for a really long time. It's the number one inhaled anesthetic as of right now. And so the medical community actually used it for about 150 years without understanding anything at all about how it worked. That's crazy. But they be doing that kind of stuff. They do. They absolutely do. Those mechanisms that I described earlier are really recent discoveries. Like in the 2000s, we know about how those things work. Before that, it was like, I don't know, just makes people happy. (laughs) Just a happy, happy times. Yeah. And even now, like the mechanism is not 100% clear to like the medical community. People don't know exactly how it works. This is like people's best guess based on like animal experiments. That's crazy. So it's wild. But basically before they got this, you have to mix oxygen in down. They noticed that people were like, quote unquote, overdosing when given like 100 percent nitrous oxide, which is not technically true because those people actually died of hypoxia or oxygen deprivation to the brain. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. So they weren't ODing. They were just taking away the oxygen. Yeah, literally. Their brain cells are just deprived of oxygen. So at that 70-30 blend, the idea is that it's basically just producing an anesthetic effect biologically, but at like a 50-50 blend, it produces analgesic and anxiolytic effects. So if you tell a dentist you're afraid of the work they're doing, you'll get like a 50-50 blend. But if you're having like a wisdom tooth removed, you might get up to a 70% nitrous oxide blend with 30% oxygen. So it just, they vary it based on like how severe something is. But for childbirth, for instance, they give a 50-50 blend. I would love to test this out, but I don't have any wisdom teeth to pull. I got it during my wisdom teeth extraction and it was, ah, chef's kiss. I loved it. Are you loopy afterwards? Like cannot operate a vehicle? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But it clears your system. They say it clears your system in about three minutes after you stop exhaling it. Okay. So you inhale it. If you do like a single puff, it lasts for between one to five minutes. And if you huff it consistently, it still clears your system about in about three minutes after you've stopped inhaling it. Okay. So it gets out of your system relatively quickly, which is like one of the huge benefits. Yeah. I'm very interested in this for a childbirth. So I really am too. I will say, even at the 70-30 blend concentration, it isn't necessarily strong enough for, like, major surgeries. Yeah. So, in the 1800s, like, mid-1800s, I think it was 1845, they started mixing it with diethyl ether and or chloroform, which sounds terrifying to me. Yeah. To put patients under for surgery, and that was actually used by many hospitals up until the 1930s. Wow, okay. And today's method is slightly different and slightly more advanced, but inhaled anesthetics that we use for surgery today are built on pretty much the same principle and include nitrous oxide a lot of times. Hmm. And it's super fast acting. So if you've ever had any kind of surgery, they basically tell you, you know, breathe in, count backwards from 100. You ain't getting past 97. It acts so fast. Right. So it's fast and it's not super bad for you. And that's why people do it for fun. I mean, exactly. Hmm. So since the 1800s, people have been using laughing gas to, like, party. Um, Humphs. One of old Humphrey's bros from early in the story described huffing nitrous as, quote, like returning from a walk in the snow into a warm room, which sounds pretty pleasant. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. It also sounds crazy when you know it's coming from someone who's super high. I mean, absolutely. (laughs) 
He's also a super high poet, which I feel like is a different. You're on a different plane. You of are on a different. <laughs> he's probably testing out mushrooms too while he's right. At it. Literally, he's like, I'll eat a mushroom. Why not? Why not? Um, who am I? Right now, today, nitrous oxide is actually commercially available in things like cans of whipped cream or uh, whipped cream or Ready Whip, which uses nitrous oxide to basically push the canned cream out of the little tube. Oh. And that, my friend, is what the kids call these days whippets. You are an old lady, but continue. <laughs> I know. I know, but I'm like, I never... Those whippersnappers. Did you ever know anybody, like, when we were in high school that did whippets? No. Not, no, same. I mean, I probably did, oh, but probably, I didn't know we they probably were doing did. that. Yeah. But it's actually been around, like... It, it kind of had a resurgence during the 70s. So during the 1970s, you could buy balloons of it at places like music festivals. But before that, if you were going to party with nitrous, you basically had to have a dentist or a doctor friend who could like sneak you a tank or a tank. Oh, a tank. Oh my God. People do this by the tank full. Oh. Or you could have a friend who worked at a restaurant that made its own whipped cream because they sell those little nitrous canisters if you're going to make your own whipped cream. Oh, Starbucks. Starbucks. I'm sure they have those. Yeah. All right. So those were basically the only two types of profession that like had access to nitrous oxide tanks. And the reason that it got the nickname Hippie Crack was because of its prevalence as a music festival drug. It's all coming full circle now. No, right, totally. And now it's back to being a fairly popular party drug. Like I said earlier, it's considered the 14th most used drug in the world, but that's if you consider like medical uses as well. Mm. So basically part of the issue and one of the possible like downsides is that when they make these canisters, they have to cold compress the gas to get it into those little like ready whip canisters. So inhaling it straight from those can actually cause frostbite of the face, mouth, and larynx. Oh, shit. Which is why it became popular to pass it out. They basically take those canisters, they siphon the gas off into balloons, and they pass balloons out at festivals. Yeah, safer. And then you just inhale it from the balloon. Okay, quick disclosure. I'm not telling anyone to go do whippets. I'm not. They have some serious, like if you do a lot of them, especially, or you prolong your exposure, it can have some really serious adverse health concerns, which I'll talk about. But inhaled doses typically cause the euphoric effects for like one to five minutes. There have been some cases where people during that time try to drive or walk off Mm. of a platform, something like that, and injure themselves. But it's non addictive. It may be habit forming if you do it over extended periods of time, but it's non addictive. And some of the negative effects that it can cause is like if you huff it consistently, it can kill brain cells by causing that oxygen yeah. loss. So that's a thing. But irreversible damage is basically only going to happen with super high doses or prolonged exposure. And there are actually no risks of like chemical addiction or withdrawal. Okay. So. It's it's definitely one of the better drugs we've talked about. Like, if you're going to do a drug, don't do opioids, do whippets. 100%. I'm just going to say it. I mean, don't do either, but if you're going to do one or the other, yeah. this if is way safer. A, if you have the choice, yeah, it's better. Yeah. It's a good, exactly. not great situation. If you decide to do a ton of nitrous for, like, extended periods of time, it can produce memory loss, limb spasms, depression, and even psychosis. So if you're going to dabble... Don't do it for long periods of time. It's actually federally legal in the U.S., Mm. and it's actually not subject to DEA purview. So if the police catch you with, like, nitrous oxide canisters, they can prosecute you if you're planning to sell it to people who are going to huff it because of a misbranding law. Hmm. and it's locally illegal in some states at the state level for the purposes of, like, altering one's mental processes. But the possession of things like whipped cream canisters is completely legal, just not for minors. Okay. So if you're a teenager and you buy a can of whipped cream and they check your ID, they think you're about to go huff it <laughs> and you cannot have it. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Up until recently, it was actually legal in the UK, and it was outlawed um, 
for recreational purposes under the Psychoactive Substances Act of 2016. So that's like a super recent law. So anyone selling those canisters in the UK can face up to seven years in jail. Hmm. Um, what's interesting is that among the youth, this was a very unpopular decision. The youth. Right. (laughs) And there were these, like, massive protests in response to this law being passed that included, like, these giant huffing parties on the lawn of Parliament. Oh, shit. Like, teenagers were going and, like, huffing these canisters on the lawn of Parliament to be like, you can't stop us, basically. It was crazy. Why did they outlaw stuff like this? I mean, part of the reason is they said, number one, in high doses, it can be toxic. Um, What I will say is, since 1993, only 30 people total have died of nitrous oxide inhalation in the UK since 1993. So that's like a super relatively low risk drug. Most nitrous oxide deaths generally result from, like, extreme overuse. For example, one of the cases in the UK that helped push this law forward was in 2016, there was a university student who was found dead in his room with around 200 of these canisters around him. Okay. That's a lot. Right. That's more than a lot. I don't even know what that is. I mean, at that point, you're acting crazy, right? Because it's not addictive. Sounds like there was something else going on. There 100% was. But that's part of the reason that, like, the government in the UK was able to push laws like this forward is because they were like, well, our our young people are doing it and it's not safe for them. The other reason is when they go to these festivals and stuff and they sell it in balloons, it's a massive littering problem. Hmm. So the government was able to basically push that forward as, like, it causes a lot of litter because people drop the canisters, they drop the balloons, it ends up with, like, garbage everywhere. We hate it. It's outlawed now. Hmm. The other way that people die from nitrous is by placing a plastic mask or bag over their head. Well, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> right. Which it basically, they, they say that it like heightens your high yeah, by restricting the taking flow out of oxygen. Oxygen, yeah. Exactly. Which I just want to pause really quickly. If you ever find yourself strapping a mask or bag to your head for recreational purposes, you need to stop. Yeah. You need to think, and you need to remove that bag and go read a book. If you do find yourself doing that for the fun of it, you are making a bad decision, period. No, 100%. That's wild. So that's what I know about nitrous oxide. I'm so happy it came to fruition. I was really excited whenever I voted for this, and then it lost, and I was mad. (laughs) I know. It lost by such a close margin. I was like, I better do it anyway, number one, because I already had the episode done, and I was like, this is a lot of fun to learn about. Yeah. So we hope you guys think it was fun, too. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. If you have another reco or you think we should cover something, send us a DM or or an email, and we'll put it on our list, our listing tin. Absolutely. Malpracticepodcast at gmail.com. Hit us up. Don't forget to subscribe. Leave us a rating and a review. Those help out so much, and we love reading them. Thank you guys if you've already done it. Follow us on social meets. Otherwise, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Don't huff any nitrous in between. Don't. Or do so carefully. Just be careful. Be careful out there. And don't forget, malpractice malpractice makes makes perfect. perfect. Bye.